And now your host, Richard Thomas. Hello, and welcome to It's a Miracle. You know, sometimes a story comes along that is so filled with humanity that it's simply overwhelming. And our first story is one of these. It spans nearly eight decades and chronicles a time in American history that many people would like to forget. It's also a story of friendship and how planting the seed of tolerance in one generation can reap many rewards in the next. But above all, this is the story of a miracle. Walter Smith of Richmond, Virginia, is a sculptor with an unusual medium, driftwood. When I look at a piece of driftwood that has been treated by the tide, and it tells me something of what the tree encountered growing that shows its character and tells a story. One summer day in 1996, a commission for a new piece of artwork led Walter to the home of Violette Bluford. Hi, Ms. Bluford. How are you today? I had read an article about Walter Smith and his unique driftwood arrangements. Uh, you a when he came to visit, to he brought some marvelous pieces. You get some idea of what they look like when I'm finished. I have not seen anything like them before nor after. As Violette prepared refreshments for her visitor, Walter noticed something that intrigued him. Miss Bluford, who is that lovely lady? That lovely lady. Violette explained that it was her grandmother, a woman known for her gift of storytelling. And I have such marvelous memories of her. Speaking of stories, I have one. It's something of an amazing story. When I mentioned to Walter that my grandmother was a wonderful storyteller, Walter says, ah. Do I have a story to tell you? We had this gentleman that sold vegetables. Walter spent the next hour recounting events in his life so rich in detail and emotion that it left Violette almost speechless. When Walter finished his story, I was overwhelmed with emotion. That's all there is. His words actually flow the way a poem would. And I knew this was something really special. That story is much too good not to be shared with the world. She said, I want you to promise me that you will write this down you before you die. I promise you I'll try, and I'll bring you the first copy. I and I said, that, and I if you think it's that important, I will do it. I went home, thought about it, I had very limited writing experience, but the details were pretty easy to remember. And as I started to write, many memories came flooding back. When I was eight years old, the stock market crashed. Life changed so completely. My dad had lost his job and we had very little cash on hand. We had very few toys to play with in those days. We made a lot of our toys. We would have the tin cans and we'd use them as trucks or as a car. One day, along came this man with a wagon with all sorts of vegetables and fruit. His name was King Brooks. He was a kindly black man who plowed his farm a few crops with an old mule named Maud. Well, what if I take a couple squash and two carrots? Mother picked out a few things that she needed, and he greeted me real nice. So I asked the man if I might ride down to the end of the block with him. May I Thank have you. a ride? Sure, if it's OK with your mom. Please, Mom, can I? It's OK with me, but be careful. All right. Come on up. Take you to the end of the road and drop you out and let you come on back home, OK? I thought I was sitting on top of a mountain. It looked like an awful long ways down. To be up there and going down the street was quite a thrill. 
I was disappointed that I wasn't going further. Ooh. Ooh. Well, this is the end of the line. I told you, Mom, we won't go no further than the end of the road. When King yeah. let me get off and yeah, well, I was waving goodbye to him, well, maybe so. I was afraid I wasn't going to see him anymore. And I wanted to do that again. What a Come and get so Walter's well. wish came true. Nearly every day that summer, he rode next to King as he made his deliveries. He called out in a crackling voice, corn, tomatoes, beans. Corn, tomatoes. He did it in such a beautiful way, I enjoyed hearing him sing it. Fresh red apples to come to, all these carrots just for you. And a woman would call out and ask him how much his tomatoes were. He would tell them, and I would take them to the porch and bring him the money. He taught me to count. He taught me to make change. 17, 18, 19, 20, and a nickel is 25. OK? OK. I knew that he was kind of slow, and I was much faster with him. I was helping him by saving him the trip. Good job. It made me feel real good to feel like I was helping somebody else. As the days passed, Walter began noticing things that he hadn't before. In the 1920s, drinking fountains were labeled, toilet facilities were labeled. The black people could not go in the white, and the white people could not go into the black. Aren't you thirsty, Mr. King? Yeah, but I can't have a drink here, son. Why not? Well, it's the whites only. Come on, let's go. go. I really didn't understand why black people were treated different from white people. But at that young age, I didn't question it. But he also refused to follow the rules. Here we go. When it was time for lunch, King would pull the ball over to the side, and he'd tie the feed bag on it. Come on. Then we would go into the store, and he would buy some stuff for us. I'm hungry. How about you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we got a knee-high and a cheese and a soda crackers. How much do I owe you, sir? Twelve cents. Twelve cents. We would only have one drink between us because he couldn't afford to pay for any more than that. Let's get some of this rat cheese. Hey, you know where rat cheese comes from? Rats. <laughs> As we sat down on the curb, he would pass the drink to me, and I'd drink some out of it, and then he'd drink some out of it, and just set it down between us so nobody would see it. Because in those days, black people and white people were not supposed to drink out of the same vessels. And the Lord don't care nothing about no colors. You got one color, and I got another. The Lord don't care nothing about that. He told me God made us all, and it didn't make any difference whether you were black or white. You know what? What? You got a good heart. <laughs> and he taught me how to be forgiving and take people, regardless of age, race, or color, all the same. Slowly but surely, this unlikely pair were becoming the best of friends. And at the end of each day, King would reveal his feelings in the best way he knew how. Did you have a great time? Be careful. He would come back by my house, and he would say, we have lots of butter beans left, and we have lots of potatoes left. What can you use? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Brooks. Oh, you're very welcome. And that was the way I was paid. All right, see you then. I felt very good that I was able to contribute something to the well-being of my family. As the country slowly pulled out of the terrible economic depression of the 1930s, the long summer days on the wagon also came to an end. It wasn't too long after the third year that I worked with King that my dad got a job. We moved out of the home that we were in, so suddenly I did not have an opportunity to see King and tell him that we were going. 
I was real sad that I didn't get to see King Brooks. He had been a great friend and had done a lot for me. Years later, as a young man, he returned to the neighborhood in search of his old friend. But King Brooks seemed to have vanished. His name was King Brooks. Well, have you seen him around? There was only one that I could find that remembered him or even lived there Thanks then. Anyway. I appreciate it. He didn't have any idea where I could even look to find him. He used to do this job selling vegetables. He was a colored man. I tried everything. I'm sorry, I can't help you. No more I could do to find Thank King. You. And the war was getting hot and heavy. The Navy took me in, and I went to war. And then the search was absolutely stopped. But the lessons he'd learned from King lived on. On one occasion, I was on leave from my squadron, and the bus was loaded with people. All white people in the front, all black people in the back. The bus approached one of those country stops out there on the road. He picked up this colored gal that had a baby wrapped in a quilt. And there were no seats, and there were black people standing up. Ma'am, would you like to take my seat? You need it more than I do, right? I'm more than happy to give it to you. She said, thank you, sailor. And she sat down in my seat. The bus rolled on a little bit further, and when he came to a place that the bus driver could get out of the middle of the road, he pulled off. OK, lady, back of the bus. You know better. Sir, I gave her my seat. She goes to the back of the bus, or the bus don't move. He said, young lady, you've got to get up. The law is the law. You trying to make me lose my job? No, but I, I... So she stood up, and when she did, I said, give me the baby. It's OK. And I looked up at him, and I said, is there a law against this? Not as I know of. Well, then get up there and drive the bus. I held that baby for about two hours. It made me angry when he told her that she had to stand up and hold the baby. It made me angry because there was such a law in existence. It just didn't make sense. After the war, Walter tried once again to find his old friend. Hi, sir. My name's Walter Smith. I want to know if you can help me find an old friend of mine. He was a colored man and a huckster around I here. I wanted to let him know yes, sir, what an impact he had on my life. I can't help you. Old he King. made a delible imprint in my mind. A long time. A real long time. About kindness and compassion for other people. Next door, they may be able to help you. Thank you. But I never did find the right person to talk to to tell me where he was. The years passed, and Walter raised a family of his own, handing down King's legacy to another generation. I did everything I could to teach them to be concerned, loving, kind human beings, which goes back to what King was showing me. It was a time of incredible change, and Walter was encouraged to witness events that would reshape the country. The civil rights movement was beginning. We were able to see black people who were qualified to do jobs get the opportunity to do them. These people are being able to realize their goals in life without anybody saying, hey, you can't do that. And I would love for old King Brooks to see that happen and see that a part of life as God intended it. I wanted to show people what kind of a man it takes to make this country great. And I had prayed for an opportunity to put something together that would show both races that we can live in peace and harmony. One seed Brooks planted years ago, he planted in my heart that seed of love from God above means true friends never part. 
Walter had finished his story, but little did he know that the pages he held in his hands were about to bring him a miracle. My concern for what I had written was that it wasn't strong enough. I wanted them to know what a good man King Brooks was and what a good man every one of us could be if we followed those examples. I was hoping and praying that that message and a better America would come out. And so he had a secretary in his office professionally type his manuscript. The finished pages were then copied and he headed out to mail them to friends and family. At that same moment, a Federal Express courier was arriving at the office. That particular day, I happened to catch this guy out the corner of my eye. And I just went over to him. Hey, buddy. Hey, how you doing? Fine. How's it going? Oh, everything's fine. What are you doing? Just as unexpectedly, Walter found himself eager to share a copy of his story with a virtual stranger. And I'd like very much uh, for you to read a copy of it. And okay. What's give, me it? A, give me an opinion on it. Okay, what's it about? It's about my childhood. I wrote a little bit As Walter it. told him about his old friend, the vegetable vendor, it stirred a memory from the young man's past. Well, I know that well. I used to go there with my father when I was a boy on a truck selling vegetables over there. Is that a fact? Oh, yes. He says, I know a man used to deliver vegetables, but he didn't have a truck. He had a wagon. From my friend King. King? Yeah. King Brooks? King Brooks. Did you know him? I said, that's my great uncle. Man, I've been looking for you. <laughs> the friendly courier who had approached Walter for no rhyme or reason was none other than King Brooks' grand nephew, Gerald Brooks. He said, I've been looking for that man for seven years. He said, no, I've been looking for you. <laughs> I am really trying to find you <laughs> so that you could uh, tell me where he lived. Uh, oh, yeah. Somebody from the family. His home is still there. Still there. I could hardly believe it. I almost fainted. God has seen to it that I got my desire. Yeah, man, I got you. I don't want to let you go. I was afraid for him to go and leave me and go into the building because I read something might happen to him before I could get him in my car and take him out and see where the house was. It was an eerie feeling. Two days later, Gerald and Walter traveled to the Brooks family farm. A long time. A lot of years. Yep, man. For Walter, the old homestead was alive with King's presence. In the five years, I wanted to see that. This is what I thought of King Brooks having been there with a mule, plowing the fields that we were standing in the midst of. Thank you again for bringing me out to let me see where old King lived. It's meant a lot to me and I'll cherish the memory. While I stood under the shade of the big tree, it was almost as if he was still there in the midst of us, asking a blessing on us. After a lifetime of searching, the little boy, now an old man himself, had been reunited with his dear friend. Here's your buddy. When he showed me the gravesite, I felt like I wanted to pick him up and say, Brooks, I'm back. You could just feel the atmosphere. My king and I were finally there together. The experience was equally powerful for Gerald. He turned around and he looked at me as if he said, I am so relieved that I finally found my king. He was, That's what he called him, my king. He was such a, a lovable person. I got goosebumps. I have never experienced that feeling before, and I'll probably never experience it again. That day was a special day in my life. And today, Walter and Gerald continue to remain an important part of each other's lives. Lord, Uncle King and Walter must have had a beautiful relationship together. Yeah. And let's take that relationship, that love, and transfer it into our family today. Let everybody say, Amen! Amen. Sunday is the family day around the house. And we love to invite Walter. You can feel a certain air about it, that he wants to be there. He feels at home. And we have a blast. And the family loves him. I mean, loves him to death. I feel that I have become a part of Gerald Brooks's family. 
and I am so thrilled to be accepted into that type of family because they are the family of God. Now, 50 years after King Brooks' passing, his spirit does indeed live on. The best thing to come out of this story for me, with King, is my children. I'm hoping that when they go out into the world, that they will see that people shouldn't fight each other. People can learn from each other. If I can plant a seed in a kid today, like my Uncle King planted in Walter 70 years ago, it'll all be worth it. It'll pay off. Because that seed flourished. King Brooks was my friend. He was my inspiration. I loved King Brooks because he gave me the formula to live by and to love by. I'll always carry him in my heart forever.